by the authority vested in me by the Senate of York University. I hereby confer on you the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa, admitota ad gradum. Congratulations, Lehman. <laughs> Chancellor McMurtry, President Shukri, faculty members, graduates, families and friends. It is a great honor for me to receive this recognition for the work I've done over many years uh, for and with children at youth at home and abroad. And I consider it a real privilege to be able to be asked have been asked to address a class of graduating students, most of whom will be working in the professions that many of you, I hope, will be working with children. Today is a celebration for you and a commemoration for me. Exactly 60 years ago, I sat, like you, in a convocation hall, somewhat to the south of here, waiting to receive my diploma. I remember the occasion well, but I have to confess that I have some difficulty recalling the who it was that gave the convocation address and what he, <laughs> because in those days it was almost certainly a he, had to say. So you'll be certainly forgiven if in 60 years you no longer remember me or my words, but I am still hopeful that you'll be able to profit from some of the lessons I have learned over my long life, and that perhaps one or two or even more of you will end up in 2071 addressing another graduating class of young Canadians ready to set off into a world as unimaginable to you now as your world was unimaginable to me in 1951. Let me start by telling you some of the differences between then and now, telling you about some of the differences. They're fresh in my mind because two weeks ago I came to Toronto to, atten to attend my class reunion. At the celebratory dinner, sir, several of us had been asked to share anecdotes about our, our undergraduate years. And as one brief presentation succeeded another, I realized that what we were doing was recreating for ourselves the unique atmosphere of those times. Of course, as young university students, we were privileged, just as you are, and that many of our contemporaries had had very different experiences. Yet I remain convinced that each generation has a distinct ethos and that every member of it makes it part of his or her identity. On the whole, My generation of graduates was an optimistic one, and we were full of confidence. The Second World War had been over long enough for its pains and privations to have receded from our young memories, and the charter of the recently created United Nations, uh, which promised to prevent such a global tragedy from ever occurring again, filled us with hope. We were not yet aware of the Cold War that had already started nor were we anxious then about the threat of nuclear annihilation. As we shared our stories of college life, I saw that we'd been a lighthearted bunch, unafraid of the future, in fact, enchanted by it. Talk about rose-tinted glasses. We'd had a good four years, with some exceptions. We had had lively and interesting professors, and we had got to know them and our classmates well because our programs were fixed. We couldn't drink in residence, and there was not all that much drinking outside, except, of course, among the engineers. <laughs> Only in my last year was I able to sneak into the King Coal Room in the basement of the Park Plaza, and I was still underage when I graduated. I don't remember any of my classmates seriously involved with drugs, but we smoked like fiends. It was cool, a term even then we used and no one told us that it would cause cancer. 
We fell in and out of love all the time, but most of our sex was foreplay, constrained more by fears of pregnancy than by STDs. <laughs> our communication technology consisted of a radio, a portable typewriter, the telephone down the hall, and letters. After graduation, Dobbs were easy to find, and we married young and had large families. As I look back now, I can see how innocent we were of all the world's, of the world's problems. I was going to say ignorant, but perhaps that's too harsh. What we were was unaware of the dark side of our prosperity, the price our planet would play for our consumers, consuming, our, would, would play and continue to play for the consumerism we embrace so cheerfully. The exploitation of children that has come with the new technologies. We found so, the new technologies we found so exciting and the diseases that would emerge as the world shrank. On the day I graduated, the population of our globe was approximately 2 billion, 100 million. This year on Halloween, there will be 7 billion of us. Shortly after graduation, I married a man who became a diplomat. And together, we slowly woke up to the real challenges confronting our generation. Most of his working life was focused on issues of international peace and security, arms control and disarmament, the role of international institutions such as NATO and the UN, and Canada's responsibility to the wider world. His career spanned the 40 years of the Cold War. And among the hard realities of international politics that I learned along the way was that one of the major forces that kept the US and the USSR from blowing us all up was known as MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction. Towards the end of his life, however, when the Cold War was over, Jeffrey became increasingly preoccupied with what he, thought, what he saw as the new threats to human security and human survival. Threats that were not even on our radar screen, radar screen 60 years ago. He talked about them whenever he had an opportunity, and I'll repeat them now because I think he was right, and that these are the challenges that you and your generation are going to have to confront. The first is climate change and all its implications, especially for the poor. Floods and droughts are already undermining food security and increasing the numbers of people, especially children, going hungry. The second is ethnic conflict within states rather than between states, such as we see in Afghanistan and the Congo, as well as Libya, where tribalism is strong. The suffering has shifted to civilian populations and children have become weapons of war. His third concern was about plagues, emerging pathogens, and the global spread of disease. All these threats are compounded of course, by the explosion of the world's population. He was also concerned, as we all should be, by poverty, and especially by the growing gap between the rich and the poor, both between nations and within nations. Poverty makes people sick, inequity makes them worse. Sometimes I think that like Pandora in the ancient Greek legend, our generation opened what we thought was a treasure chest of riches and let loose instead a massive cloud of ills. But before you get too discouraged, remember that the last thing to fly out of Pandora's box was that elusive thing called hope. Because along with all our mistakes, all the mistakes our generation, our generation also helped to create at least three tools your generation can employ to overcome these challenges and to build a flourishing society. These are expanding scientific knowledge about who we are as human beings, new information technologies, and universally accepted human rights frameworks. Scientific standards are much higher today than they used to be, and we know a great deal more about how human beings develop in childhood, as well as what constitutes the social determinants of health. With respect to the new information technologies, the sky is the limit. Most of you grew up in cyberspace, but it was our generation that discovered it. 
However, let me focus for a moment on the third tool we helped to create, the whole body of international human rights instruments that have emerged under the aegis of the United Nations since the end of the Second World War. All the covenants and treaties negotiated among nations and then ratified, thus committing states to guarantee human rights to all without exception. Since 1989, all of my work on behalf of young people has been framed by the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I have found it to be a rich document addressing every aspect of children's lives in a positive and constructive manner, a catalyst for the culture for the creation of a culture of respect for the dignity and worth of every child. 60 years ago, it would have been unimaginable that virtually every nation in the world would allow itself to be held accountable to the international community for its treatment of children. But now, in spite of all their failures, they do. So for good or ill, it was my generation that gave definition to the latter half of the 20th century, and now, for good or ill, it is you, yours that will shape the 21st. So as you set out from here into the wider world, here are my final admonitions. Be mindful, be curious, be capable, and above all, be compassionate. Congratulations to you all, and the best of luck.